Okay, Boker Tov, hope everybody's doing well. Okay, we're up to class class num number 30 in our uh, ongoing series on the Sidur. We'll try to get through most of Rabbi Yishmael Omer. We started last week and we discussed whether um, when the rabbis make a drasha, make uh, an analysis of a verse well beyond the sort of plain sense of the verse, are they creating the law, a new law that would not exist had they not said that or are they just the laws were given to Moshe at Mount Sinai and we're just looking for we had an oral tradition we don't really need these threshold it's just a place to look looked upon them you know to find a place to link them to and we said there are this is a debate but I think that the view sort of where I'm more comfortable with and I think the majority view is that at least in many not in all but in many many most of the circumstances rabbis are creating um, new law in other words um God gave the Torah incomplete, like he gave us an incomplete world, and we have to interpret the law. That's part of the famous story with Rabbi Elez and Rabbi Yeshua. We discussed much of this last week. We discussed with Ruth when they made the law that only a male convert from Ammon and Moab can come. That the, Before that, they didn't have that law. A hundred years earlier, a woman from Moab converts, her conversion is invalid. And when they came up with this law of Moabi, below Moabi, which was, they, they have to have a good reason they can't just make it up so that actually the law changes from here and that's why the Talmud is so concerned how do you know this what verse how does it, it teach you if it was just a, a mechanism to have a place like as a memory device really the law exists independent of the verse it's not so important how you derive run verse but the study of Talmud makes it very very important okay that's just a very quick review um we discussed Kalba Homer and Gzei Shava last week so we said in many ways they're two they're two opposites Kalba Homer is a total logical argument no verses at all you never need a verse for a Kalba Homer that's what makes it a Kalba Homer if the law applies here how much more so it applies somewhere else it's a logical argument and it, and Gzei Shava is when you look at two words we discuss kicha kicha to get married, and uh, the fact that we get married by by money by giving a ring is derived from Abraham. The same word is used kicha isha when a man takes a woman. That same word is that Abraham took the field from Ephron Hachiti, and there he took it with money. So here it's with money. So that you can pretty it's pretty wild. You got to be pretty careful. So there we already do have a notion much more so that it is based more on tradition. Although sometimes also there, because the words are extra. Well, why, why is this extra word said here? Oh, that word is said somewhere else. It's a hinting. We do that in modern literary analysis all the time. A phrase appears in two different places, a strange phrase. So we know that's a way to link the phrases. Uh, what I just want to mention one law I did not mention in, in Kava Homer, if you've learned, if you learn Baba Kama, is where it comes up, known as. Dayola bomin hadin liot kinidon. Kavachomer can be a little complex too, but it means like this. You cannot derive more than what you're deriving from. What do I mean by that? In other words, I can't say, oh, he's so great X, so he's greater 2X. No, you can say he's greater, so it's also X. So the example given in the Torah is when uh, when, when Miriam speaks Lashon Hara against, against Moshe, so Moshe says, if, you know, if somebody would spit in God's face, whatever, would, would talk... Uh, negative against God, they'd have to be uh, thrown out of the camp for, for seven days. For If you speak about, I'm sorry, against a, a person for seven days, how much more? If you speak against God, that would be 14 days. So they say, no, it's going to be only seven days. You can't take more than what you're learning from. When you do a, a Kabbalah Homer, you can only say if it applies in this case, it also applies in that case. But you can't say if it applies in this case, it doubly applies. It's going to be even more in that case. Okay, that's just a side point on how... Um, uh, how a cup of homer works. I did want to mention one idea before we get to Binyanav. We're going to go through uh, hopefully a, a number of the other you know principles. Um, is the Rambam's enumeration of mitzvot? So I mentioned last week that the uh, we don't have an agreed upon list of six hundred and thirteen mitzvot. As one of our speakers mentioned this week, I think it was uh, Dr. Sokolow mentioned on Wednesday night that the the only place there's one other reference, even less. And just passing. There's only two references in the entire Talmud to the notion of 613 mitzvot. One is when Moshe breaks the tablets. So it says he broke the tablets. That, the, the Torah that was 613 mitzvot. There's zero discussion about that. And then there's the Gemara at the end of Masechet Makot, where Rav Simlai says, Torah Tziva Moshe. Torah 
in Gematria 611, Tav Bav Reish He, and the first two commandments, this is a debate, but according to Rashi, the first two commandments were said by God himself, and that's why the third commandment goes to the third person. The first is Anochi, Lo Yelecha Al Panai, on my, you know, on me. And then the third one is Lo Yisa Hashem Hashem Al We're talking passively about God, because the famous Midrash, the Jewish people, it's too much. I can't take it. And uh, there for um, Moshe revealed. So there were 611 by Moshe, Torah, Tzival, and Moshe, and two by God. No, that's uh, The Ramban disagrees, by the way. The Ramban says all 10 were said by God. Okay, how that fits into 613? Not for now. That's another discussion, an interesting discussion. So the Gemara then goes down, 613, and then David made it 11, and six. Uh, I think I mentioned this last week. So um, the, one of the Rambam's rules, the Mishnah Torah is a summary of the 613 laws of the Torah. That's what the Mishnah Torah is, uh, to tell you how to observe the 613 meat spot. So the Rambam has to tell you how many laws in Shabbat. You count every law in Shabbat. Already in Shabbat, you have 613,000. Forget 613. So, um, so he has rules what to count. So the Rambam says you do not anything derived from Yud Gimel Mitot. This I believe I mentioned, but I didn't explain it. Anything derived from the Yud Gimel Mitot, the 13 principles, is not counted as one of the 613 mitzvot. Now, why and who cares and why does it matter? In other words, why does it matter if something is part of the 613 mitzvot, if you have to do it anyways? Who cares if Shabbat is four mitzvot in the Torah or 40 mitzvot in the Torah? Who cares if the 39 melachot are one? That's one prohibition in Torah, not to do one of the 39 melachot, or you count as 39 prohibitions in Torah. What, what difference the, the doesn't make, I, I have to do it anyways. I can't do anything during my milk. So why does it matter if we count it as a mitzvah? I think this is an important question that nobody ever raised in all my years of education, where we talk 613, I never ever heard anybody raise the question, why does it matter? We have to keep all the mitzvah, even if it's not technically one of the 613. So I, 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 I think I have an answer, but I'm curious if anybody else would like to, uh, to um, express their view on this or have any comments or thoughts is, about is this. Is the punishment different? No, no. We punish a person even um, if it's derived from the Yud Gimel Yes, we, in other words, if you violate any one of the 39 Milachot on Shabbat, you get punished. You bring a, let's say, a Kurban, even though it's only one mitzvah. You don't have to say you have to violate all 39, because all 39, that in the counting of the mitzvot, all 39 Milachot, are only one mitzvah. So no, the punishment, it's a good, a good approach, but no, that doesn't work. The punishment counts even if it's just derived from the verse and it's not stated directly. The Rambam says if it's not black and white in the Chumash, like honor your parents, it says Kabeda Rabicha, Shamor Yom HaShabbat, keep Shabbat, that's one. So if it's not black and white in the Chumash, it doesn't count as one of the 613 mitzvot. Now the Rambam, we, we have to observe it. So why does it matter? So it, I, I guess the reason people don't know this and people don't talk about it, if, if my answer is, is correct, which, you know, I don't know, but I, I think it is, if my answer is correct, it's it misunderstood. It's a little bit of a dangerous answer. And um, it's not, and, and it's also has no practical application. That's what makes it dangerous if somebody wants to make it into practical application. What I mean, so um, basically, I think I have discussed at some point, um, um, is um, what, what, when you, when you look at the Gemara, we discussed last week, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi, um, Rabbi Ishmael, they disagree. This one says it is a mitzvah. This one says it isn't a mitzvah. So um, ha, this one says this is allowed, this isn't allowed. So if it's not in the Torah, wh what do we do? We have a Sanhedrin and the Sanhedrin votes. And whatever the, we believe in democracy, the, the Sanhedrin is very democratic. And this it was very smart. The person of the least experience had to speak first because we didn't want people being cowed over. Oh, he's the God of Yisrael. How can I disagree with the great Torah authority? No. So we want the person who knows the least, the, the rookie on the Sanhedrin. We want him to speak first. So nobody is afraid to express their legitimate opinion. You debate, you discuss, you argue, you take a vote. Majority rules. So what happens if 100 years later, they want to overturn? Let's say the court says, Roe versus Wade, I'm sorry, they, they've taken another case and they want to overturn a previous decision of this, this Sanhedrin. Can they do that? Of course they can. The Supreme Court can overrule. They can say, you know what? You said there are 39 melachot. We don't agree with you. We think there are 28 melachot. 
we think writing is not the, they didn't really do it in, in the Mishkan. They wrote before the Mishkan, that, that doesn't count. So you're allowed to write on Shabbat. So to us, that's like radical. That's like, are you crazy? But that, that's, we have that all the time in the Gemara that um, the, they said this and they changed their mind. So the Rambam believes, I mean, we all believe, that's what it means to be an observant Jew, but the Rambam is the one who expresses it in the, the, the sharpest terms and the most adamant about it is our Torah can never change. That's one of the principles of, of belief, our Torah can never change. I, halacha changes all, all the time because the halacha is the application of Torah to real life. So as real life changes, the application of Torah has to change, but the Torah itself can never change. The principles of the Torah can never change, but the interpretation of the Torah can change and it does change. So therefore the Rambam, to make the Torah eternal, the Rambam could only count things. These The, the things that's eternal, never ever changing, no court, nothing, that's what's written in the Torah. How to interpret the Torah? Oh, so we follow the interpretation of Rabbi Akiva. Well, why do I want to follow the interpretation of Rabbi Shema? We follow Beit Hillel. You don't know, Beit Shammai. There are debates, recording, right? Um, uh, let's take, I don't know, off the top of my head. I don't know why, because it's it's next week's, you know, Parsha, um, Amor. So if, uh, if a, um, a Kohen, God forbid, loses a relative. So we all know the Kohen can go to the funeral. So does the Kohen have to go to the funeral? A parent of a coin dies. The coin says, I don't want to become Tame. You know, I know the Torah allows me. The Torah allows me to eat uh, eat Gebrux on, on Pesach. But I don't want to eat Gebrux on Pesach. I want to be very religious. I want to be very observant. So, I, yeah, the Torah allows me to uh, to be Tame. But that's an allow. The, 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 the Torah allows you to have a slave. The Torah thinks it's a good idea. No, the Torah doesn't think it's a good idea. The Torah allows a soldier at war to take a non-Jewish captive and shave her and all these crazy things in order that he won't actually want to marry her, but he can marry her. But the guy said, no, no, I, the, Torah, the Torah speaks to our negative inclination, but it would be better not to, it would be better not to do it. The Torah allows it. So the Torah allows the Kohen to become Tame because it's very hard to tell a coin he can't go to the funeral of his parent. But this coin is deeply religious and, and deeply, you know, I'm sorry, my, my parents would want me not to come to the funeral. You know, you have like a, the, the, the football player, you know, they have the, the parent dies and they play in the game the next day. Because that's what my father would want, you know, that I should go play football the day, you know, after he buries them. So maybe, lahabdil, 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 so maybe the coin can say that. So what, what do you say about that? Does he have to go or he can go? So you know, you know the answer. What's the answer? Amachloka, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Shmo. It's a debate. Um, some say he has, I, Rabbi Akiva, we paskin, we observe he must. It's not, an, it's not optional. That's a mitzvah. It's an obligation of the Torah. And the other people, no, no, the Torah allows it. It's not a mitzvah. It's not, a, it's not an obligation. The, other, the Torah allows it. It's not a, one of the 613 mitzvahs. So the, let's say the Beit wants to change the rule. So that would change because it's not written in the Torah it, one way or the other exactly. It can be interpreted in two different ways. So the Rambam can only count mitzvot that are black and white in the Torah. I mean, I, I say, as you can, I, I introduce this by saying it's a little bit dangerous and not practical. We today don't have a sun hedging. So we today don't have the ability. And we're trained very much to think that the Torah is eternal, which it is, but we're trained to think the interpretation of the Torah is eternal, which it is not. That can change. And uh, I mentioned, I haven't mentioned it for a couple of years, and, uh, but I mentioned, the, the beautiful, um, I, I can try to send you in English, it's a fantastic introduction to the nature of Torah, the oral law, given by the Doravi. Anybody know who the Doravi is? The fourth generation. That's what the book is called. The book is called The Fourth Generation. Who's the first generation? The first generation, the Chatam Sofer. Great Rav Moshe Sofer, the one who battled reform very much. Rav Moshe Sofer, the eldest great-grandson was Sh uh, Shmuel something Glasner. His name was Glasner. There, I've met some of his descendants. One of his descendants I think, is, is a judge in Washington, married somebody, you know, like uh, whatever. He was a Hungarian. The Khatam Sofer, as we know, was Hungarian. And, uh, and uh, although he wasn't really, he was actually, actually German. The Khatam Sofer was born in Germany. And he wrote in every one of his chuvot, he always signed it. Um, Moshe from 
you know, Frankfurt, the main, he, he always saw it, but he moved as a teenager with his Rebbe, Rav Nassim Adler, and he ended up in, in, in Budapest, in, in Hungary, uh, and I'm sorry, in, uh, in Pressburg, in, uh, which today is called Bratislava. He ended up in Pressburg, that's where he's most famous from, he spent the last 40 years of his life there, and uh, his descendants are Hungarians. So his oldest great grandson, his name is Glasner, um, was lived. He died in 1924. The the, the Sofer died in 1839. So uh, um, this Glasner, Reb Glasner, was a big Tamachacham, a major major Tamachacham. He lived in Hungary, and the, he had a problem. He was a Zionist, and uh, it's, today's Heiyar. I mean, yesterday was Yom Atzmut, but today's the actual Yom Atzmut. We don't celebrate because of, of Shabbos. But um, so he was a big Zionist and Zionism didn't go over so well in Hungary. And um, he moved to Israel, but then in his, the later part of his life, but he wrote a commentary on Masechet Chulin, which is very commonly studied. You want to get smicha, you know, that's all the laws of keeping kosher. So he wrote an introduction. He called this book the Dorevi because he was the eldest. He was the first of the fourth generation of the Chatham Sofer. So obviously he viewed the Chatham Sofer as the patriarch of the family. So uh, he writes there an introduction to the nature of Torah. And, and part of it is explaining his Zionist philosophy, but uh, that's a little bit less important for our purposes now. But what he explains is that the, uh, we had an oral Torah. Why was the oral Torah written to the Mishnah? Because we were exiled. It was after the destruction of the temple. It took 150 years till it was all completed. But Rabbi Yudha Nasi said, no, you know, that's it. After the Hadrianic persecutions, uh, it's impossible to pass on our tradition. Orally, we have to write it down. But that's very bad. That's not the way it's supposed to be. They broke eight lasot lashem, he buried Torah techa. The Gemara quotes the verse. We had to nullify the Torah. It's against the Torah. You're not allowed to write Torah. But if they wouldn't write Torah, we wouldn't have a Torah. Sometimes you got to break the Torah. Eight lasot lashem, a time tack for God, he buried Torah techa. It's a pasuk in, in Tehillim. Um, so, um, so he wrote, okay, we had no choice choice but that's not the ideal and he says the reason but why did we want the Torah to be oral we want the Torah to be oral to so it can be flexible we know when something is written down uh, you look in the text we have a precedent we can't go against the written word when something is oral it's much more flexible and malleable so the the um the Dora V Reb Glasner explained that the Torah is meant to be oral because we do not want the rabbis of generation two to have the influence, I mean, maybe they to, to rule based on what generation one says. We want every hashofeid asher yeh bayamim ahim. The Torah uses that expression a lot. Put it the judge in your day. We don't paskin like Rav Yosef cards. Yeah, we paskin the rabbi up to today. We hashofeid asher yeh bayamim ahim. And in every generation, life is different. The, the principles are applied differently. So we want an oral flexible tradition. Of course, that's harder in a sense. You know, you got to think of it on your own. We couldn't do it. We couldn't do it for 2000 years. But then he writes, now that we are returning to the land of Israel, we're going to be able to go back to the original method of Torah study and the original, the oral method and not precedent. We won't have all these books. It's an unbelievable idea. I mean, it, it's it's so logical. I mean, they don't teach this stuff. I don't know. It's, I don't know, whatever they think. Maybe it's too hard for people to learn. But uh, I know about it. Rav Schechter was the one who introduced me to the Dora V. Um, Schneer Lyman, I think, published uh, uh, a translation of the introduction in Tradition Magazine. I think if you Google it online, you can find most of it. Uh, Glasner Shmuel, I forget the full name now. Moshe Shmuel or Shmuel Moshe Glasner. Um, anyway, so that's the idea that, that Torah, interpretation of Torah is a dynamic process. The Torah itself is speak, the written Torah. That's God, never change. God is eternal. But therefore, the Rambam can only count that which written towards. So the six, so the on a practical basis in 2022, it doesn't really matter if something is a mitzvah, one of the 613, or just the right. It doesn't matter. We have to keep them all. And we consider an interpretation of biblical law. If a future generation, a future Sanhedrin will change that biblical interpretation, that biblical law will change. But the Torah is not changing because that's just the rabbinic interpretation of what the Torah means. So, um, so that's why the Rambam is so insistent that we, we do not count the Yud Gimel Midot as part of 613. 
like I say today, it doesn't matter. Okay, any questions, comments, or if you want to throw stones on me for being so radical, that's uh, that's okay. All right, um, fine. Let's go. Let's continue Binyanab. So we did Kava Chomer, Gzei Roshava. Binyanab, I'm going to try to run, I'm going to try to finish most of this today because I do want to start, maybe not right at the beginning. We'll see. I want to start with, with Mismor Shir next week already to get into the real dubbing. Uh, these 30 classes are the introduction to to Psuke de Zimra, although I think the introduction will be a, will, will be a lot slower. Anyways, okay, Binyana. What is a Binyana? Binyana means uh, a built father. It means an Ab means uh, a principal. And Binyana, we build up the law from the one principle. In other words, a principle is stated once in the Torah. We apply it to all similar cases. So, for example, it says in the Torah we can cook on Chag Hamatzot. Uh, that's the Acha Sheri Echol Lechol Nefesh, except you can't do any Melacha on Pesach. That's in, in chapter 12 in Shemot, where we have the story of the Exodus. We read it on, on Shabbos HaKodesh, the, the Shabbos before Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Um, HaKodesh is Elechem, and then uh, the laws of Matzah, and it says, however, you can cook. So, but it only says that on Pesach, Maybe Pesach is a special holiday because food is so central to Pesach. Matzah, chametz, uh, maybe Shavuos and Sukkot, cheesecake, maybe you got to make in advance. Uh, Sukkot, you got to cook in advance. So no, we have what's called the Binyan Ab. The Torah said you can cook on Pesach. Shavuos and Sukkot is also a Yontif. Pesach is a Yontif. So therefore, we're allowed to cook on all the Yamim Tovim. So that's what we call it Binyan Ab. The Torah only mentions it once but it applies to all other cases. That's called a binyan av. That's binyan av mikatu vachad. It's written once in the Torah that I can cook on yontiv, on one yontiv, but there's no reason, I mean, we could have, if not for the, I mean, maybe uh, if we didn't know this, maybe if the rabbis didn't have this, that's what Rabbi Shmuel is teaching us. If we didn't have this principle, one could argue the Torah says you can cook on Pesach. I'm going to distinguish, like I said, Pesach is special. Food is a special idea, but food is not so important on Sukkot and Shavuot. But no, Binyanab teaches us that we can apply it to all other similar, all the other Yom Tovim, including Rosh Hashanah, obviously not including Yom, Yom, Yom Kippur. Um, then me Binyan Abu Mishtek Tuvim. So that's the same principle. Binyanab, in other words, sometimes you need two verses to tell us. So this is the first Mishnah in Baba Kama. The first Mishnah in Baba Kama, Arba Avot Nezikin. There are four categories of damages. In other words, four categories where the first time you cause damage, you have to pay 100% damage. You know, for, for those who learn Kamara, so, you know, when people make fun of Kamara, you know, the ox scores the cow, like who cares, you know, or it's a, okay, call it a, so a, a car accident if you'd like. But um, so, you know, that if you have an ox or a dog, whatever you have, or uh, if you have um, an a gores, unexpectedly, you only pay half the damage the first three times. Then after three times, that's called a short term. It's, it's, you don't, oh, wow, that was unusual. Uh, that was really crazy. Well, why did my ox gore somebody? That's terrible. So you didn't, you were, you're a little responsible. We can't blame you because it's, it wasn't expected. So you pay half damages. If the ox gores every other day, then no, then you got to pay full damages. So the Gemara says there are four types of damages where the first time you pay 100%. Because you, you got to know, you got to know, you can't say, what I mean, why did it for? So a, an ox walking on the street is going to break whatever it walks on, that you have to pay. That's shore bore, mava, and hever, or light a fire. I can't say I light a fire in my backyard and it, it, whatever, and it goes and it causes damage to you. I can't say, oh, I, I didn't expect that to happen. Or a bore, I have a pit. I, I, I dig a pit on the... Uh, on Main Street, and somebody rides his bike, and I don't put a fence, you know, the construction company doesn't put a fence, and somebody injures himself because they, you know, they have a, a one foot, even it doesn't have to be so big, a big, a ten fucking, whatever, they have a little three feet, it has a, a, a pit, and the guy injures himself, well, you got to know the first time, you got to pay full damages, so there, with, um, it's Mishnek Tuvim, the, the way the Torah learns it, it's not anything that, as the Gemara says, is holech umazik. Anything that causes damage um, and you're responsible to watch, it's, it's not just sure. The, the, the Torah describes damages by an ox and by a sheep, but it applies to any animal. How do I know it applies to any animal? Maybe an ox causes more damage. An ox got horns. It can hurt more, right? Maybe other, you don't have to pay. So the Gemara derived, 
well, let's look at an animal and let's look at a pit. Well, they're very different because the pit is stationary and the animal moves. So the Gemara says, no, you can ride, but each one of them, you have to watch, and you have to cause that and cause damage. So therefore anything that you are responsible for and it can cause damage, whether it's stationary or movable, you have to pay. I hope that wasn't too complicated. If it was, don't worry about it. All I'm saying is sometimes, and maybe I didn't explain it well enough, I apologize. Sometimes it takes two verses in the Torah to explain a principle. Often one verse can explain it, and sometimes two, because had the Torah only written bore, a pit, I would have said a pit because it's stationary, but uh, something that movable, I, it's too much to expect the person to watch. Other people should be on the lookout for it. By the way, I don't think this law applies anymore, but we have, you know, I said, if an ox walks on the street and it, it crushes your bicycle, obviously you got to pay 100%. Obviously, ox is going to walk and break your, your bicycle. In the time of the Mishnah, the halacha was short or shoot harabim. On, in a public, on, in Toronto, on Bathurst Street or Third, Fifth Avenue or on, on Yafo Street or, or Dizengoff, right? If you're walking in the public square with your ox, right? right? When that's what people used to do. So um, then it actually isn't your responsibility. It's responsible of the guy not to leave his bike on the street. You know, this is a public area. Animals walk here and animals cause damage. So it's a fascinating law because the damage can be totally expected and normal. Then it'd be, but it, the, the ox is not out to damage. That's just what it does. That's the way it walks. It doesn't look what's on the ground. So therefore it becomes the responsibility of the person with the object not to leave it there. That's fascinating. It's only in the, if, I, if I take my ox into your backyard, to your property, then, then it's my responsibility. But in a public square, I have the right to walk with my ox. I, it, it, if it gores, I've got to pay half damage. That's the, the walking, that's a normal activity. That's the way the public works. Cars can drive on the street. Oxes can walk. You have to walk. You don't cross on a red light. Don't blame the other person. That's a fascinating law. I don't think today, if you walk with your ox on the public square and it causes, it breaks a bicycle, you can get away with it because our, that's not acceptable behavior. But in the time of the Mishnah, that's just, so that's if you learn Baba Kama, you get all these details. Okay, let's go. Um, then we have four or three principles. Klalu prat, prato klalu, klalu prato klalu, yadadain el ina prat. A principle, a, 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 a general rule and a particular rule, that's that's the rule. Klalu prat, general, klal, a generic rule, prat, a, um, an individual rule. Prat u klal, an individual and a general rule. Doesn't explain anything. Klalu prat a a general rule, a specific rule, and a general rule. Then you can only do it something that's like the, um, the, the specific rule. So what's this all about? So this, uh, it's, it's similar to Binyanav, but the idea that, um, that the, the Torah sometimes says, well, I'll, I'll give you the example that they, they use. The, uh, um, the example is, Adam ki akri mechem korban. When a person brings a korban, a sacrifice, beginning of a yikra, min ha you bring it from an animal. And then it says, min ha-bakar, min son And then the Torah says, it has to be from either cattle or flock, a sheep or a goat, uh, can't bring, uh, can't bring a, you know, uh, can't bring whatever animal you want. It's got to be son ubakar. You can't bring, uh, you know, you know, you know, chicken, whatever. So why why does the Torah have to say both? Why does it say a general principle and then a specific principle? Why does it say animals and then it lists the specific animals? So you know why? Because the the specific animals limit the principle. The if I just said animal, I think any animal. So the Torah then says no animal, all animals. Ah, but now I'm going to define the type of animals only son ubakar. So that's what we call a klalu prat. The prat the specific detail limits the principle. Then you have the reverse. You have a prat uklal. So it says, if I give a person an ox or a sheep to guard and, um, and he doesn't do it properly and it causes damage, he's responsible. So maybe I'm only responsible. And, and they said, a, uh, uh, an ox or a sheep or all animals, or all animals. We're going And so why does it have to say an ox? Why does it say... Um, all animal. If it said only an ox and a sheep, I would think only an ox and a sheep. 
So the, the, the klal, the prat is overwritten. In other words, whatever is written second in the verse overrides what's written first in the verse, right? A, klal, a general principle is then limited by its details and the details are then expanded by its general principle. Whatever comes second, it overrides what comes first. Okay, it's that I hope I'm not, I hope I'm clear enough. And I know this isn't normal sort of explaining of the, of the doubling, but we do say this 365 days a year. So I do think it's important to at least a little bit try to go over this. Um, by the way, if someone who's really on the ball, I shouldn't say that, will ask me a question from this week's Parsha, uh, the famous Rashi, Ishimova Vitirao, that Shapto Tai Tishmaru, right? The, uh, a man has to fear of being an obvious parent. And, and keep Shabbos. Uh, no, that's not a question. That actually proves what I'm saying. I'm sorry. See, I was wrong, right? Because what happens if there's a conflict between what your parents say and Shabbat? You keep Shabbat. The Shabbat overrides the parents, right? Ishimova vitirao, but that's only if you can do it Shabbat Taiti Shmor. It's a similar idea, actually. So you have Klalu Prat. Um, you always look at the second thing. So then you're going to ask me, so why say the first thing? Why didn't the, why didn't the Torah then say, bring your korban from Sonu Bakar. Why does the Torah have to say the word beima? It's an irrelevant word. If I say a general, if I say the general principle is limited by the specific case, and only the specific case, only Sonu Bakar, but I can't bring kol beima. Can't bring every animal. So why mention every animal? It's not true. Why? Why is it? Or or if the Torah says shor and se and all animals, so why mention shor and se? Why not just say all animals? understand the question in klalu prat and prato klal in klalu prat the klal is unnecessary and in prato klal the prat is unnecessary because we're only following the klal we're following the prat is that clear somebody not their head okay so the reason and that i should have brought it in um menachem i i i read this um menachem elon i i hope people have heard of him the great menachem elon menachem elon died uh 15 years ago he was a uh, learned in, in Hebron Yeshiva, was an Eloi, uh, a tremendous Tamil Chacham. And uh, then he became a member of the Israeli Supreme Court. He, I believe, taught at Bar Ilan University. And he is the almost the founder of the field. You know, they always talk about the founders of the field, Mishpat Ivri. How do you apply Jewish law in, in a modern state? And you know, a three volume, I think they translated much of it into English, the principles of Jewish law or something, or the three volume, it's like uh, 1,500 pages in Hebrew on Mishpat Ivri has a whole section on, on Drashot, what we're discussing now. It's a phenomenal book. How how Jewish law developed and how it was applied. So, so Menachem Elon and his, uh, when he discusses this, so he, uh, that's where I saw the, the question, why do you have to, uh, why mention one? Uh, the, the only one of them applied. So he said, if the Torah had only mentioned Sonu Bakar, then I might've used the Binyanav. I would have said, oh, it's son, uh, it's Sonu Bakar. No, it's not Sonu. In other words, how do you know when you say the Torah mentions it once and it applies to other cases? And how do you know when the Torah mentions this, it doesn't apply to other cases. So if the Torah had just said, bring a sacrifice from Son of Akar, so it's like, Son of Akar is an animal, this animal, I can bring on animals. So by the Torah putting animals and then Son of Akar, the Torah is telling us they want to limit the animals. In other words, if the Torah just says, um, if the Torah says you can cook on all holidays and you can cook on Pesach. So then I would mean I could only cook on Pesach. By the Torah, why does it have to say all holidays? If I just say, just cook on Pesach, I say Pesach is a yontav, Sukkot is a yontav, Sabruot is a yontav, I can cook. That's what we do. That's exactly what we do. Because the Torah doesn't say klalu prat, it just says the prat. So I can expand the prat. But if the Torah had said a klal, you can cook on yontav and you can cook on Pesach, cooking on Pesach is unnecessary. So it must be cooking on Pesach um, limits the principle of klal. Of the principle of you can cook and every other. So you need, it's true, we, we don't use it, but that's to tell us that because I would have used it if not for the fact that it was there. It, putting it there tells me don't use another method of interpretation. When the Torah has a general rule and a specific rule, the Torah is telling us only do the specific rule. So we ignore the general rule, but the Torah had to write the general rule because if it only wrote the specific rule, I would say, ah, the Torah is just mentioning the specific case as an example, but it applies everywhere. So I hope that's clear. So you have, right, you can see already how complicated it is and you can see why the Talmud is full of 85,000 debates because this one says, 
This is a principle. This is how exactly you apply each of these and which principle do you apply is not always agreed upon. Plus, as I mentioned last week, Rabbi Akiva has his own set of principles. He doesn't accept Klaluprat. He uh, reboy. He does reboy umil. It's a different way to apply the Torah. So these 13 principles are not even agreed upon by everybody. So it, it, that's why the Talmud is so full of debate and discussion. And that's what the uh, Dora Viva says. Every generation, the Sanhedrin should fix the law. We are living in a post ex we're living in an exilic society. We're only in the Atchalta, the Gula, the middle, wherever we are. We haven't yet created a Sanhedrin, but I get asked that in school here. When are we going to create a Sanhedrin? There have been attempts in 1948. You and Leib wrote a 75-page book. I mentioned this once before. The first year I ever heard in my life from Ravar Lichtenstein was when I was in the Chris Kola at YU, and we were learning Masechet Sanhedrin. Uh, that, and Rav Lichtenstein, um, um, the first year was about what's the definition of Eretz Yisrael. What does Eretz Yisrael mean? There are different definitions. There's what one definition for Shemitah and True and Maser. There's a different definition for um, Yontav Sheni Shogaliot. And there's a third definition for where you can give smicha. You can only have a Sanhedrin in Eretz Yisrael. You're going to give real smicha. So how do you define the contours of Eretz Yisrael are not always one and the same. Whatever. So he was discussing what's the definition of Eretz Yisrael. And then he discussed for giving smicha. And he mentioned Yehuda Leib Maimon's book. Yehuda Leib Maimon was the first minister of, of religion. He was uh, quite a character, like many of these people are, are real characters. And he wrote a six-volume book. I don't know if it's in English. Sarei Hamea. The 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 uh, princes of the hundred. Those are the rabbis who lived between 1840 and 1940. You know, our generation start the fifth thousand year started in 1240. Right, we're always 240 years right ahead of the secular calendar. Like we're in the year now. What do we hear? 222. So we're in the year uh, whatever we are. To, to the, yeah, 200 and. In 40, we're always 240 years different. The year 1240 was the year 5000. So the Maya, the Maya began in 1840. So 1849, 40. He used to travel, he used to schmooze with all the rabbis. He met with all the Gadolim and he wrote fascinating stories about them, you know, uh, like, uh, like whatever. It's very interesting. So he wrote up, he was a Talmud Chach. I mean, he had a phenomenal library. I think he was the one who donated to Mosad Harakuk. I think the library, it started from his library, I believe. And he was a, he was, he wasn't a Gadol Yisrael. He wasn't one of the Gadolim. He was a serious Talmud Chacham. And uh, so he wrote a book urging the rabbis, now that we're back in Israel, to recreate a Sanhedrin. Because according to the Rambam, we have the ability to recreate a Sanhedrin. And there was an attempt made in the 1600s, 1500s, to create it in Spat, Rav Yosef Karo. Rav Yosef Karo wrote the Shulchan Aruch after he got smicha. Rav Yosef Karo got smicha from uh, Yehuda Beirab. Uh, seven people got smicha. And that's why he wrote, that's a uh, read uh, Yitzchak Tursky's book. Well, why was the Shulchan Aruch written? It was written as the code of Jewish law by an ordained, a real ordained rabbi, uh, the Smicha, and that was going to be the new constitution of the new Jewish state in spot in the 1500s. It didn't work out that way. It didn't work out because the Ramam says all the rabbis in the world have to agree. So whatever, though, there is the, the ability to recreate a, a Sanhedrin. But it uh, hasn't happened yet. And obviously, Rav Lichtenstein discussed the book. And uh, I think I think Steinschel's tried. Uh, people tried. But uh, it's very hard. And we, we, when we have a Sanhedrin that everybody agrees, we know this the complete Gula and the Mashiach will come. That, that we know. We can get everybody to agree. But um, anyway, so, so that, but that's how these Limudim work. Do we have debate? So every generation would say, I think it's a Kalu Prad, I think it's a Rebu Mir, and every generation would decide. Today, we fixed the law. The law got fixed with the mission of the Gemara, and the, we, it's very hard. Not impossible. Certain things have changed even in our time, but it's very difficult. It's very difficult to change a principle that's established in the Talmud next to impossible. Um, principles established later, we do a little bit. Okay, let's continue a little bit. Klalu Pradu Klal. Klalu Pradu Klal means a general principle, a uh, specific case, and a general principle means it's not only this, it's, it's both a Klalu Pradu and it's a Pradu Klal. It's both. So you have to, what you have to do is you have to do something that is ke'en ha'prat, something that is like the, the um, it's similar, but not the exact same thing. Okay, uh, let me just run. I'm not going to go through all 13 because some of them are really complicated and we really don't use them very often. But I will discuss number 11. 
כל דבר שהיה בכלל ויצא לידון, לא, אני מצטער, נאמר 10, כל דבר שהיה בכלל ויצא מכלל עולמי, לא לומד על עצמו יצא, אל לומד על כלו כלו יצא. Whatever was in a principle, it left the principle, it comes to teach you about the whole principle. What Hayab Bichlal Yatsam Bichlal? It's not teaching about itself. It's teaching about the whole principle. The, this is how we know Hilchot Shabbat is this principle. How do we know there's 39 milachot, or, or this is how do we know that each one of the milachot is a separate milacha? So that's derived from what only one milacha is mentioned in the Torah on Shabbat. The Torah says Lo Tasu Kol Milacha. Torah says don't do any work, but uh, we don't know what the work is. And then the Torah says Lo Tavaru Eish. So lighting a fire, now how do we know what the 39 malachot are? That's derived from its proximity to the Mishkan. So the rabbis had a, a tradition, whatever they derived, Torah is next to the Mishkan, 39 malachot, 39 forbidden activities, including lighting a fire. Lighting a fire is one of the 39 activities. I don't need a verse in the Torah to tell me that. However, I derive all the 39 malachot from the juxtaposition of the Mishkan to the, um, to the laws of Shabbat. Whatever was necessary to run the Mishkan cannot be done on Shabbat. And lighting a fire and cooking and all those things were necessary for the running of the Mishkan, writing, etc. So therefore that can't be done. Okay, so I don't have to mention any malacha. So davar she'abichlal, lighting a fire was included in the prohibition of lo tasu malacha, don't do any work. So why did the Torah have to have another principle, lo tovareish b'chol moshotech and b'yom hashvat. That's yotzei minaklal. It left the principle lo lo lamed al asmo yatsa. It's not to teach us about lighting a fire. It's to teach us about klal klo yatsa. It's to teach us about the entire principle of all melachot, and that's sort of what Zev was asking earlier. That each one of the thirty nine melachot is considered a separate melacha. Meaning, if I if I write on Shabbos and I cook and I uh, turn on a, a light and I water my field, I have to bring four korbanot chatat. I have to bring four sin offerings. I don't say I bring one sin offering because I violated the one mitzvah of not doing work on Shabbat. No, the Torah mentioned one specific case. Say each specific case has the full authority of the laws of Shabbat, and even for one, you got to bring a korban. So if you Violate one, you bring one korban. You violate two, you bring two korbanot. So you have to bring each one of the 39 melachot is a separate melachot. It's not melachot. It's 39 categories of melachot. And that's derived from the fact that the Torah specifically mentions lotivar eish b'chol moshotechem b'yom hashabbat. Okay. Now, the way of the barla made me inyano, the barla made me so full. So I'll take uh, just a, an example I think we do all know, an easy example. The barha made me no. So you have to understand the Torah in context. You know what's what's written in the context. So he says, "Lo tirzach, lo tinaf, lo tignof." So what does "lo tignof" mean? What does "lo tignof" mean? Kidnap. Don't kidnap. Well, that's not what it means. It means don't steal. No, I, this week's parsha, lo tignovu, lo tishakru. This week's parsha, there's again a lot of the Ten Commandments are repeated. A lot of mitzvot are repeated in in Gedoshim, Maybe extra nuance. Don't steal. That means don't steal. Don't don't uh, don't take money from somebody. So why in the world is lo tignov in the Seder brought? As Zev correctly points out, the rabbis say it doesn't mean don't steal. That's not one of the Ten Commandments. The Seder they brought. Uh, no, no, it's, it's don't kidnap. Why? Because because the Two before it are don't kill and don't commit adultery. Well, those are capital offenses. Uh, so it must be the Ten Commandments and violating Shabbat is also a capital offense. And idolatry is also a capital offense. And honoring parents, actually, this is interesting. Honoring parents is also a capital offense. If you hit your parents, you curse your parents. We have a death penalty. And you have long life if you honor your parents. So everything in the Ten Commandments is, uh, is um, you know, capital punishment, except don't be jealous. Right? Um, even false testimony, if I give false testimony, if I say Reuven killed Shimon and I'm lying, I wanted to get Reuven killed. So they, they kill me as the, the punishment. And whatever I want to do to them, they do to me. So it must be that low tignov must be a capital offense. So, yes, as terrible as stealing is, it's not a capital offense. So, therefore, the Dabar made me, you know, everything else is a capital offense. So it must be stealing. When the Torah says don't steal, it means don't steal a person. Now, why would it, again, what, or like I said last week, why would the Torah and Xavier Shabbat, why would the Torah compare marriage and burial? There's always a lesson. 
the, the Torah is giving us, we can interpret the passage. Why did the Torah write it in such a strange way? We explained last week, you get married even till the end of life. You know, you're, you're dedicated to your spouse. How you get married and how you bury go together. It's all one long life, hopefully all together. So the Torah seems to be saying that stealing money is like, uh, it's like taking a person's life away. What's the Hebrew word for money in the, in the Torah? Damim, damim, blood. That's the Torah uses the context, uh, he has no, um, uh, that's also no money. I, I, the, the Torah key, um, so because stealing is, you know, you, they violated the actual person. It's not really murder, of course, but the Torah uses the same expression. So I think the Torah in the Ten Commandments wants to say, lo tignov, they write it. They could have said, um, I don't know what they could have said to, for, for, for kidnapping. I don't know, there's somebody tell me what the Hebrew word would be. Um, but the, the Torah purposely wrote it in a style where it sounds like, and of course, Ain me cry, you'd say, me de pshuto. Every verse is also the pshat, the simple meaning. We're doing the drashot. Elo amitot Torah nidrashet bahem. These are the laws that we have secondary levels of interpretation. Of course, the primary or the, I don't know if it's the primary, maybe the primary practically is the halakha, but the, the, the plain meaning is also true. The pshat is always true. So lo tignov, of course, means don't steal, means money. But and on a halakhic sense, in terms of getting a capital offense, punishment, it's only if you kidnap. And that's uh, mechareh, um, that's in, in, in mishpatim. So that's the var halameid me inyano. And then we have gnevat nefesh. Okay, somebody writing. Okay, yeah. Lo tignov nefesh, right. It says, says don't be jealous of the house so it could have said don't steal a person but to our purpose he didn't say that because i think it wants to express the fact that stealing money is almost as if kidnapping you, you're you're taking the essence of the person torah it's very uh we know we've discussed many times the importance of being honest in business and money not taking money in in um in inappropriately the same thing davar hala made me um me so far. um the varla made me so fo is last week's parsha by Arayot. It says, "Don't uh, um, the, avoid all erva." And then the Torah again goes on to describe twenty-five like verses. What's erva? So that's it's sort of like a klal uprat. The Torah gives you a general idea, and then it says, "No, no, keep, keep reading on. You can't just go by what you read. You got to read the entire Torah." Okay, but uh, then we have a chenshnek to be machshim says that. That's usually how the how the chazan says out loud. A chenshnek to be machshim says that. So I, I find this just amazing. What tradition says, you know, our Torah is full of contradictions, it, right? When the Bible critics say our Torah is full of contradictions, you know why? They're right. Our Torah is full of crime. It's one of the principles how to interpret Torah. In other words, God purposely set up a Torah that contradicts itself left and right. Far at the beginning, Rav Soloveitchik's beautiful, famous, the lonely man of faith, Adam one and Adam two. The story, Torah is two stories of creation. The, uh, and uh, it's very different. Breshid Aleph is six day man and woman. In, in chapter one, a man and woman are created together. And in chapter two, man is created first, and then the, the, he goes to sleep, and God takes his rib. What's going on? Which is it? Oh, did the heavens come first? Or what came first? Totally different. So the Bible critics, for, they weren't idiots. Bible critics were not stupid people. And the Bible critics said, must be. They have J, E, P, and D. We have different, uh, different documents, and the redactor put it together. It's impossible. Nobody writes a book that contradicts itself left and right. It's like illogical. So it must be the Torah was, it was written by different authors. Obviously you have different authors. The book is gonna contradict itself. It's a pretty, you know, not a bad argument. Um, now, obviously we consider that heretical, but, uh, but it's not like it's, it's silly. Uh, there's, uh, and Rabbi Shmuel is telling us, no, no, God did that on purpose. Now, of course, what, so what do I mean? You have to find a resolution to the contradiction. In other words, so Rabbi Soloveitchik's resolution, the lonely man of faith. I mean, Rabbi Yishon was talking in halakhic sense. So there's Adam one and Adam two. There's two types of man. There's the man who wants to be in solitude alone. He's a loner. He thinks he's an independent thinker. And then there's the man who's a social climber. He can only exist. You have to have the social milieu. You have to be with other people. There are two. There, man is a complex person. We have, we're full of self-contradiction. So 
the Torah reflects those contradictions in two stories of creation. The Torah is not interested in telling us how the world was created. That's for science. Learn science. You want to know how the world was created. The Torah is telling what's the moral message, what's the purpose of creation. So then it's complex, it's complex, they're different things. So that's left and right. So, but I just think it's so beautiful. 365 days a year, uh, an observant Jew says that what the 13th of Achron Achron Chaviv, if I could say that, maybe I can. The 13th and final principle of how to interpret the Torah is the Torah is full of contradictions. Don't be shocked. That's how God did it. Now, why? why so God did it because it reflects different ideas, and you can't get all the idea in one in one package. You sometimes got to get the idea from two packages. I mean, I'm not going to get. You know, it's come up. Other people have spoken about. It. Other people know much more than I about this. You know, Mordechai Breuer, his whole the Shitat Habechinot, where Mordechai Breuer accepts the premises. He doesn't fight biblical criticism. He accepts the premises. The only difference is he says God, God, God put it in there. But yes, we shouldn't. We don't. The, the Torah is talking in different you know, out of two sides of its mouth, so to speak, because the Torah wants us to understand two totally different approaches to the same idea. Now, by this is dangerous. You'll get Bible critics. Yeah, it is dangerous, but everything powerful is, nuclear energy is dangerous, but if you don't want to have Russia taking over the world, we need more nuclear energy. I mean, everything in life, it's, a, it's dangerous. Anything that can do good can do bad. Anything, the more good, good can do, the more bad can do. And this is the Rashi in the beginning of a creation. Let us make man, right? The famous, let us make, well, who's God talking to? Who's God talking to? So God's talking to the angels. You only take advice. Ah, the apicorsing. The heretics are going to say there's more than one God. Okay, the heretics will say there's more than one God. It was, it was more important, I think, for Abraham Salvation is the one who develops this. It was more important to teach us as humility. Even God takes advice from others. Don't ever make important decisions on your own. Always consult. And obviously, God doesn't need to consult, but he's teaching a message to man. Ah, uh, it's dangerous. When God puts this in, heretics are going to say there's more than one God. You're right. But, the, but proper character and proper development is more important. We have to le learn with the risk of heresy and we have, to, um, we have to help people along and explain to them what the message is. So I'll just give you one simple example. I mean, I said the broad example. I mean, we know this is so, so don't be so shocked that their Torah contradicts itself. That's not, I mean, obviously if you're not a believing Jew, so you, you believe in JPD, but if you're a, a believing Jew, you believe God put this in, because it reflects the different dimensions of man. But just to give a halakhic example, how many days do we eat matzah? Just finished Pesach not long ago. How many days do we eat matzah for? What does it say in the Torah? I didn't share my screen. I can share, it, uh, maybe you won't believe me on this one. Or you will. Sunday. No, that's all over the place in Parsha Bo. Eat matzah for seven days. No, it's not what it says. Here you want, right? And then uh, ah, when you count the Parsha the A, eat matzah for six days. Whoa, I thought we ate matzah for seven days. How can we only eat matzah for six days? Contradicts each other. Six or seven. Can't be both. What do you mean? Can't say klalu prat. It's not klalu prat. The seven. Uh, no, no, it's a contradiction. Ah, so we have to find the third verse. The era of tochlu matzot, eat matzot in the evening. So what do our rabbis say? For the first, the obligation to eat matzot is only the first night. The mitzvah to eat is the first night. The rest of the week, the other six days, it's very nice. The Vilna Gaon goes so far to you fulfill a mitzvah. So it's a funny term. The Vilna Gaon developed this idea. Mitzvah or shoot. You're not obligated to eat matzah. But if you do, you fulfill the mitzvah. It's almost an oxymoron. A mitzvah, by definition, means a commandment. So the Vilna Gaon, this is a debate whether we use, whether we accept it. Not everybody accepts this idea. But the Vilna Gaon developed the idea of a mitzvah harashut. You're not obligated to do it, but if you do it, it's a mitzvah. So that's what he says. Shivat yamim, yes, you need matzah for seven days in Torah. But the obligation. It's the same thing, it's the same thing with a lot of mitzvahs as man grama with women. They fulfill, they. I'm not necessarily in doing the mitzvahs, but they do a key right. the mitzvahs. But, correct, but that's a correct, very good, but it's slightly different 
because there it is a mitzvah, just the women are exempt from the mitzvah. So the women have the ability to accept, it is a mitzvah to sit in a sukkah, the Torah accepts women. That's the debate. The Sephardim say, don't make a bracha, actually. The Sephardim say, you can't say a shirk, it's not a We Ashkenazim, those who are Ashkenazim, I shouldn't say we Ashkenazim, those who are Ashkenazim follow the Rabbeinu Tam, and the Rabbeinu Tam we says, can't say a mitzvah. But I think, yes, you are correct. It's a little bit complex there. But what I was saying is there's no mitzvah at all to eat matzah on the other six days. So there was, it, the Torah says all over the place, seven days, seven days. That's like a, a reshoot. Uh, that's a reshoot because it's really six and seven, the difference is one. So the one day is an obligation. The other days you can't be afraid. You got to eat matzah. Then the villa goes. Yeah, but it's a reshoot, but it's a reshoot to eat matzah today also, even though it's not Correct. matzah. I mean, Correct. you can eat matzah today too. Correct. So, but nobody would hold it's a mitzvah to eat matzah today. Where the Vilna gone, but not not everybody, by the way. Many people hold you eat matzah the second day of Pesach. There's you don't get a mitzvah. You you want to, I mean you get the mitzvah simchat yontif, whatever any other food you have to eat. But there's no mitzvah to eat matzah. Just you can't eat bread. So you're going to eat matzah. It's like today. Like right. The question is when you eat matzah on the seventh day of Pesach, it's like eating matzah on hey er. Or is, or is it somehow there's something special? It is Pesach. So that's an interesting debate. But the, for our purposes, the Torah contradicts itself. The it matzah for seven days or, or six days. But I just find the whole notion is such a, 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 be, a beautiful notion. I mean, because I guess I, as I was trained, brought up, life is full of contradiction. People are full of contradiction. Good people do terrible things and terrible people do good things. Life is complex. No one is all good and all bad. And and and, and the Torah reflects the, the multifaceted level of man and the story of creation. And not only in a philosophical sense, the way I've been presenting it more, also now in a halachic sense, you have versions Torah that contradict. And then they have to find all kinds of, I mean, Hashemaim Shemaim Lashem and La no Hashem but Aretz not Tanli Bnei Adam Lashem Aretz Umlo just thinking off the top of my head right Lashem Aretz Umlo God owns the whole land uh, or the whole world Lashem Aretz Umlo and then we say no we said in Halal yesterday Hashemaim Shemaim Lashem Aretz not Tanli Bnei Adam the Aretz is for man is the Aretz for God or the Aretz for man so how does the Gemara resolve that contradiction. Anybody Kodem bracha, Kodem bracha, bracha, lachar bracha. Before you make, it's such a beautiful gemara, so, so powerful. Gratitude. Before you make a bracha, it's lashem aretzim loa. God, the, everything belongs to God. After you make a bracha, you have permission to eat. So yeah, then, um, varz natan bivnei adam. They have this all over the place. So the, the Torah, it's a much more beautiful way to present the idea by presenting a, a contradiction because both are true. In other words, when you have a contradiction, both of them are true. Sometimes you have to resolve it. Sometimes you don't resolve it. On the one level, the, the earth does belong to God. On the other hand, it's man's earth. We do it. Both are true. Now, on a technological level, then we find a, we resolve the contradiction on a certain level, but on a certain level, the tension never goes away. That's what it means. I remember years ago in Atlanta, I see it's already after 10 30. I remember one of the first programs I ever did for Tor Motion was uh, actually two of the three people, unfortunately, are not, are not living um, Maurice Lam, Ruben Bulka, and Rifka Blau. We had them speaking on a pound 20 over 20 years ago. And I remember Rivka Blau, she was talking about women and women in the workforce and what's the role of women, you know, and, and it's changed a lot in the last 20 years. And she basically, I think she said she spoke to Rabbi Sullivan, or maybe her father, Rabbi, Rabbi Taich, I don't know if it was her father, or Rabbi Sullivan, told her that the woman is snake to be mamak, she seems as a, a woman that today, two different roles. A woman is the mother and the homemaker and blah, blah, blah. And maybe people don't like that, but whatever. And the woman is a, is a lawyer and a doctor out in the world. And that's, it's a little bit snake to be mamak, she seems as a, And every woman has to find the katuf ashtishi, they have to work out on their own. How do you resolve the tension? And everybody's going to work without it. I thought that was a beautiful idea. Anyways, there's much more to discuss. Next week, I'll please, I'll please, I just want to discuss Yehi Ratzom Lepanecha, why we end with that for a couple minutes. And then please, God, will start at Mizmor Shir. We're going to daven the Sachashkinas. So we're going to start at Mizmor Shir, not at Hodu, if that's okay. If you daven the Sachsvart, we'll get to you in a few weeks. We'll discuss why the Sachsvart starts at Hodu, why we say Bark Shamar later. But anyways, okay. Just very quickly to review, uh, we started off mainly on, on the Rambam, the, why the Rambam only counts 613 means what that are written in, in the Torah. If it's not written in the Torah, it's very nice. We assume it's a biblical law and you get punished for it and all, all the things, but it's not permanent. 
because the Sanhedrin has the right to change it. Only that which is written by God himself, because man develops, Torah Labash man develops the interpretation of the Bible with, with the tools that God gave us. You can't just invent whatever you want. You have to follow Rabbi Yishmael's rules, Rabbi Akiva's rules, whatever rules you follow. So a man does that. So one generation of man can be different than the other generation of man. Today, we don't really have that power anymore. The Dora V wrote this whole piece that that's coming back to Israel. We're going to get Torah back to its pristine original sense. And, uh, and then we just went through some of the print binyanav. Sometimes the Torah writes once. Don't cook. You can eat, you can cook on Pesach. No, nothing else. So fine, Pesach. Let's compare Pesach to everything. Binyanav. We're going to build up from Pesach to other laws. Then sometimes a klaluprat. Animals, but only these animals. Ah, so it means only these animals. And the Torah can't say only these animals because they don't say these are, of course, all animals. So the Torah has to limit. So the Torah has limitations. Sometimes it says the, if the principle is limited by the details, and sometimes the details are expanded upon by the principle, and sometimes it's like the principle a little bit, not like we all have to view the Torah in, in context. Don't steal. It means don't steal. The Pshat is true, but halakhically, uh, it's referring to don't don't kidnap because that's the context of the Aserit Hadibra. We always we all know that when you read a book, you have to read the book in context. And then we ended up with the uh, the Shnei Tavim Machshim. The Torah is full of contradictions from the beginning, from the beginning. The two stories of of creation. And you're right, it, it may create a lot of biblical criticism. Sometimes biblical critics have good points, actually, occasionally. And uh, maybe, you know, and sometimes we have answers, don't, whatever it is. But um, it's more important to get this principle, Nase Adam. The Torah, we have to, life is risky. Everything you do is risk. There are, there are physical risks and spiritual risks and moral risks. But in order to grow, if there's no risk, no reward. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. I look forward to seeing you next week. And uh, and we look forward to seeing you on Sunday, Rabbi Liebtag, 11.15. I mentioned two new, or well, one new series, Benny Gesundheit, who's starting a three-part series, one who gave the three-part series on Tehillim. He spoke before Rosh Hashanah, always super creative thinker. Uh, Benny will be giving a three-part series leading up to Shavuot Thursday morning at 11 a.m. And this Thursday, a one-time shot, um, Mark Trencher, we, we had before, um, will be giving uh, a talk on his most recent survey that I don't know. I think it might be available online. I mentioned on singles, singles in the Orthodox community <coughs> runs the professional surveys, like the, the mini Pew reports, right? But we're focusing on the Orthodox community. So that will be this Thursday at 1.15. And of course, we're going to have all our regular Shi'urim. Parsha Shavua this week will be given by Nithi Linzer, who's graduating Princeton, I think, this year. She's going to, she's a, uh, yeah, I think she's, uh, I think, she, no, maybe she's in, uh, I'm sorry, in the GPAT program at Stern. Anyways, okay, that's uh, this week, and we look forward to learning with you, and please invite a friend. Oh, let me quickly say if there's any comments in the chat box that I missed. I'm sorry. Uh, it's important to retain of access to all the previous rulings. Yes, we want to have access to the previous rulings. The Dora V right, but they shouldn't be um, conclusive. I remember Rav Shechter. I mentioned last week, Rav Shechter has a lot of very liberal views in the development of Halakha, what quote unquote are called liberal views. And he was the one who told us, he remembers watching the Eichmann trial, he says, as a kid. And the judge would say, where was a case in Idaho or something? I, 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 Idaho, and they said the judge didn't even know how to pronounce it in Israel. I, Idaho, Idaho, and he's using it as a, a precedent because some judge wrote 150 years ago something said the halacha doesn't work like that because some rabbi in Hungary wrote a tshuva. Yeah, it's, maybe it was very important at the time. It was great. And maybe we can gain insight for today. But just because a rabbi ruled 150 years ago, some ruling doesn't bind halacha. That's, a, that's the approach of the the halacha develops. There are people who say that much less, but that's that was the approach of Rav Shach of Soloveitchik. You know, mm -hmm. halacha develops. And that's what the the, the Dora V develops. Previous opinions are important, but we didn't want to write it down because writing it down gives it a permanence it doesn't deserve. Which is, it's an unbelievable concept. I I totally agree. Um, somebody sent me privately. Is it correct the way we figure out which method to use is based on the wording in the Torah? Yes, it is based on, right, have, if the Torah puts the principle first or the details first, it does matter. Yeah, when we say, I mean, this is a general thing, but applies here, when we say, Ein Torah, there's no chronological order in the Torah, that doesn't mean there's no order in the Torah, it means there is order in the Torah. 
that sometimes order is not chronological. In other words, the Torah is edited very properly. The wording, that the word structure, sentence structure is very important in order to properly understand. Okay, Gnevat Nefesh, enslaving somebody is stealing their autonomy. It's like killing them. Okay, yes. Uh, we are not to blindly obey, but instead to keep Torah as a living document to, to constantly discuss, of course. Uh, that's the expression. Of course, Torah develops in every generation. Is it, hey, that's what a Torah Chaim means. Absolutely. We, I mean, part of it is a reaction to reform, as Mark Shapiro discussed on Monday night. I remember when, when, when Jacob Katz did a semester, why you the great professor of history, the, the, the one who developed the idea of history through Charlotte Dutrou and Jacob Katz, you're right, the reform movement had tremendous impact. There was no orthodoxy. Orthodoxy came because of the reform. What we call orthodoxy. Yeah, a, a traditional community, the Palalaka. Orthodoxy is much more. We've discussed this. I mean, Rabbi Slavati, you can't go on the bus and shop because what the conservatives do with the orthodoxy got frozen to a large degree. It's very ironic and in a sense tragic. Had it not been for the reform movement, some of the reforms, the reform movement probably would have happened. But because the reform movement initiated them, they cannot be accepted. That's the reality of life. What can I do? We know often it's not who, it's not what they say, it's who says it. Maybe that's tragic and sad, but that is the world. Can I give an example of 13 principles of I think I did? Give a few I asked that question before you did. Yeah, I realized that. I realized that. Is it intended to, I have to teach in four minutes, my class starts, but okay. Is it intended to teach to respect diversity of opinion? Yeah, oh, that's also a beautiful idea. Yes, um, but it's not that the opinion is wrong. In other words, when it, yes, we should respect other opinions. Beit Shammai is very important. Rav Soloveitchik would spend three hours explaining a view of Beit Shammai, even though we don't follow Beit Shammai. It's also Torah. And it's not, the Rav said, there's no extra mitzvah to learn the Torah of Beit Hillel. That's on practical level. To the mitzvah of Talmud Torah applies equally to Beit Shammai as Beit Hillel. Even though we know in advance, we're not going to follow Beit Shammai. It doesn't matter. But when the Torah, so you're right, when we're doing interpretive, absolutely you should study. And when you study other opinions, it, it strengthens your opinion. Because you learn Beit Shammai, Beit Hillel got strong. Oh, Beit Shammai is a point. Obviously, when we learn another opinion, it, it, it impacts on our opinion. But but it's not that they're wrong. They're elu ve'elu chaim. They both have a point. But when God puts it in the Torah, both of the sides of the corner contradiction have something to teach absolutely otherwise the Torah wouldn't have put in the contradiction in other words the idea is the contradiction and the resolution it's if you end the sentence that says and the bible critics are right you can't then two verses contradict each other no no you have to find the katu hashtishi she by name you have to resolve the contradiction in some way so yes we have contradiction because both sides are true as a general rule to be to be ignored then the words are superfluous. So that's what I also explained. They're not superfluous because you need it. So I wouldn't use one of the other principles. So they're only at details. I would say I can make a binyana. I can apply to everything. By having a klal in front of it, the Torah is telling us it's a klal uprat, not a binyana. Torah says, each matzah is seven days, you must eat six days. Yeah, must eat. It's only at night of the first day. Eat. Only at night of the first day you have to eat. That's the uh, that's the assumption. Allah has. So it's not even really the Yom Rishon, right? That's a whole, I uh, don't have time, right? right? The, the, there's no mitzvah, there's no obligation to eat matzah on the first day of Pesach. It's only at the Seder. But Erev Tochlu Matzah. The resolution is because that's the first day. It's not the whole first day. Six and seven, the resolution, but Erev at night. And the obligation to eat matzah is only the first night, or for us in Chutzlar, it's rabbinically the second night of, of Pesach. Okay, want well, to wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom and be well and thank you. And we'll Shabbat pray. Shalom, thank you. Shabbat Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. Thank you very much. Okay, bye bye, everybody. Yes, I, I, I do have to run. I'm really, I really. When's I a good time to call you? I have a question about candle lighting. Okay, I'm, I'm teaching until one, so you can call me after one. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you very much. Be well. Bye bye.